my name is Sai Mukundan. I'm in the product management team, and I'm joined by uh, John here. Uh, we're tag teaming on this session, so I'll, I'll get into a little bit more on some of the technical aspects um, and talk through the life cycle of what we see with, with most customer adoption. Uh, and then John will uh, do the demo here. So with that, um, just a few more things on the technical pieces, specifically on the cloud. Um, in terms of uh, the pattern or the use cases that we see with customers, it, we, we think of it as a life cycle around the whole data platform that Aaron talked about, right? So typically what we see customers is they start with, um, you know, in using storage in the cloud. This is, uh, you know, think of the likes of Amazon's uh, AWS S3, Glaciers of the World, Azure Blob, GCS, object storage. So that's typically where we see most customer sort of life cycle or adoption journey start with respect to the cloud. And the use case around that is long-term retention, right? Like Aaron talked about, it can be for compliance, it can be for extending the, the platform from on-prem to the cloud just by leveraging the storage. And a big part of this is, as you recall, with the data lands on our platform, right? Think of it as, say, you know, files objects, but also virtual machines. And an extension of this becomes migration of these VMs to the cloud. And we'll look at what the challenges are, which is mainly that on-premise, you might have you know, your VMware, VMDK type uh, environments. And in the cloud, if it's AWS, it's ARMY instances. If it's uh, Azure, it's VHDs. So the challenge there is taking um, those formats on-premise and getting them into the cloud. And you'll see in the demos how easy or how simplified the user experience is in terms of managing that. So that's where we see most customers start. Um, the next aspect is this whole extending that, extending not just for you know, 1Z, 2Z VM types, but really thinking of it from an application perspective, right? The mobility of applications from on-premise to cloud uh, and, and vice versa. But why is that important? Application mobility is, you know, what we see a lot of customers use it for is test tab environments. The idea that, you know, they can quickly spin up these uh, apps in the cloud for development purposes, or the, the fact that even before they, you know, uh, move uh, their entire application to the cloud, they can use the platform to, to get it there, test it out, and then roll it into production, right? So that's sort of the next phase in this life cycle. Question um, for you. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Yep. So what's the turnaround time for that test dev environment to spin up? Yeah, so um, the, the turnaround time really depends on a few factors, right? A, obviously, the amount of data that needs to uh, transfer from on-premise to the cloud. Uh, it also depends to some extent on which specific cloud. For instance, uh, going from a VMware VMDK to a, an Azure VHD, uh, is, a, is a lot simpler just because it's mostly around the, the header and footer things that need some formatting and you can get it there. Uh, if you look at AWS as an example, then we leverage the AWS import capability which takes care of uh, the army conversions from on-premise. Okay. Um, so the factors there I would say are broadly three. One is the amount of data, second is the specific cloud vendor you're going to, and the third is obviously the network. Right in terms of how long it's it's just going to take. As you've been interrupted already, <laughs> I'll probably ask a question as well. Go ahead, into my mind. Um, when talking about these test dev environments, machines are not working in isolation, of course. So when you are creating a test dev environment in the clouded platform, does it also do the networking around it and the re-IPing and basically providing an environment, a complete environment to test them on, obviously in isolation? Um, does it do all of that as well, the Coacity platform? Yeah, so there is some aspects of networking that uh, we do today in terms of taking the virtual or the apps and moving them into the cloud. Uh, and we'll actually, we'll cover more of that in the demo uh, in terms of how some of the networking aspects of ha are handled. Uh, you know, uh, and some of it also uh, is um, infrastructure that many customers have set up, whether it is you know, Route 53 with Amazon or establishing some kind of a VPN between their on-premise and, and their cloud environments. So we'll uh, cover that a little bit more in the demo. Okay, I'll wait. Um, so going, going forward, um, now, now that the app applications are in the cloud, or you may have just born in the cloud applications, which we see more of, 
uh, backups of these applications become important. The, the, the same pain points or that data fragmentation that we talked about in the on-premise world, this, just that now the problem is shifting or in the process of you know, uh, getting into the cloud environments as well. So what customers are looking for is that consolidated platform, but more importantly, first protect those apps, right? So the ability to use the APIs that the cloud vendors provide and integrate that into the data protection is a key component of that next phase in that, in that like customer life cycle. And once they do that, then obviously, you know, if you look at it from a full life cycle standpoint, you want to be able to bring that application back, whether it is on-premise or you know, perhaps to another environment, that full life cycle management becomes very important. Uh, and that's something that we are addressing here as well with our, with our ability to run on-premise in the cloud and, and really span both these environments. And last but not the least, uh, we have seen that if uh, customers are beginning to talk or ask about the whole uh, the concept of multi-cloud, um, I will uh, you know uh, preface it with the fact that um, it's it's more uh, early days, or sort of like a like a step you know, or a vision that uh, many CIOs are looking at. Primarily from you know uh, being vendor agnostic, be, uh, thinking about um, you know the future in mind, which is perhaps they are looking at. Uh, you know, in the future, they, are, they may go into a number of uh, mergers or acquisitions or the business reasons that may force them to either move from vendor A to vendor B uh, and consolidate for, uh, like, say, bring their contracts together or uh, enterprise agreements together. But nonetheless, multi-cloud is something that is beginning to surface a lot more in, our, in, the, in the conversations that we have had with customers. And you will actually uh, look at a demo where we are making this possible with what we do today. Right? Um, so with that, let me dive into the first use case uh, before and set it up for John, so he can he can go through the demo. Um, so here, uh, what we are talking about is we have the data platform. Uh, the data lands on us again through policies, and this is the the, the classic traditional like aspect of being able to uh, back up data on premise, uh, and then. Through policies, we can send it to either AWS, uh, Azure, uh, GCS, or any of the on-premise uh, S3 compatible uh, target types, right? right? And everything that you will see here is policy controlled. And the idea is uh, being able to retain the data for long periods of time. Again, the data is encrypted, deduped, and, and compressed, uh, both uh, at rest and in flight. Now, one other extension of this, uh, beyond the aspect that it can, it can be recovered back to where it came from, uh, is we can also recover it back to a net new cohesity platform. So imagine the scenario where um, the, the, um, the site that you sent the data from were to go down, right? So now you can easily rehydrate the data into a net new cohesity platform, be it virtual, another physical, or in the cloud directly, right? Um, so by the way, uh, the platform that we run in the cloud is called uh, the Cloud Edition, uh, and you will see uh, in, the, in, the, in the demos as well uh, how that platform in, in the cloud is pretty much exactly the same as what we run on-premise, right? So the, the power of the platform remains the same, independent of where you are running it. So what's so unique about, uh, or the differentiator in terms of why the storage efficiency, or how do we achieve these storage efficiencies in the cloud, right? So the first thing, I'm just going to walk you through our dedupe capability as it relates to transferring data in the cloud. So imagine this is the data set that's landing on premise. So the first thing that we do is we dedupe, we build the index. The reason the index is important is to provide recovery. Recovery that, that enables users to search and recover as opposed to having to remember you know, which, which point in time, which date. Um, so we build that index. And then we send the data to the cloud in the most efficient manner with the dedupe on, and that serves as the reference. And the index is also sent up there. The reason is because, if you recall my previous slide, uh, the ability to recover the data to a net new cohesity in case of um, a, a disaster, right? And if you roll this along, as more and more data sets, as incrementals come along, what you will see is we are only sending the changed blocks include not only on-prem, uh, the way we store it, but also how we send it to the cloud. Now, this is very important because many of the competitive products out there end up sending you know, large data sets, uh, and that obviously has impact on your network, 
it has impact on um, you know the amount of storage costs that you're paying to the cloud vendor uh, and obviously when we look at it from an egress standpoint now you are having to recover larger data sets as well so building that reference and then managing it in this way gives us a lot of storage efficiencies compared to the competition so and in, sorry the, uh, the index is kind of metadata yes okay metadata of the so there are basically two kinds of uh, indexing that, that you know, broadly speaking, that we do. The first thing is, in the policy-driven approach, you have information on 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 policies, what what SLA is associated with, um, the aspect of just you know names associated with either the virtual machine or or, or the uh, the data set that we are backing up. Then we do another second level of indexing where we actually crack those virtual machines open. Uh, um, you know, have a list of all the files folders, so that way you can not only search based on VMs and, and, and job names, but go a step further and look at just pulling individual files from the cloud. Okay, so it's a hierarchical kind of uh, metadata. Exactly, <clears throat> so that's also something that we'll, we'll cover in the demo where you will see a granular uh, file recovery. So how do we do that? Speaking of recovery, how do we uh, enable that granular recovery, right? So again, back to the ease of use, and uh, um, and that's always top of mind. Um, user here searches for a specific file, right? As opposed to remembering what it is or which point in time they, they need to go back to. We then pres get the index, if not uh, uh, from uh, the cloud, and this depends on the retention, right? We manage the retention both on premise and in the cloud. So uh, if the, the data set is only available in the cloud, then we go ahead. Uh, and present that data from the cloud. If it's already available on-premise, then you know you, you are able to retrieve it from the on-premise data data set. So we fetch that. Uh, again, you will notice that we only recover the blocks that are relevant, right? And then present it back to the user. So I think this is a good time to uh, get into our first demo. Uh, so John, I'm going to hand it to you, uh, and uh, rock and roll. All right. So, I. I'm John Hildebrand. Many of you know me as I've sat on the other side of the table a few times at these particular events. Um, what I'm going to do, as Sai mentioned, what we're going to take is going to show a brand new VM. Well, I wouldn't say a brand new VM, but we're going to set up a job for the first time and we're going to archive it, not, not just to one cloud, but to the three big public clouds that we have available all at the same time. So let me get authenticated into my environment here. So what I'm going to basically do here is we have a VMware environment. Um, even though, even though we have, or even though I'm showing a VMware environment, we do have support for Cloud Archive to be able to come from places like a Hyper-V environment, Nutanix's hypervisor, um, and I think we're continuously adding some more hypervisors as time goes on uh, to the mix. So first things first, I'm authenticated into the Cohesity platform here. So what I'm going to have to do is, initially, we have to set up some external targets. Um, this allows us to connect to the cloud resources available, whether it's an S3 bucket, Azure Blob Storage, and I think GCP calls them buckets as well. Notice I don't have any here. Um, through, through the UI, we can add these things. Um, as I click on here, we've got the capability. You enter in based off of the different type of storage as you can see, multiple different types of storage and tiers available within. Uh, what I do want, at least want to show here is the fact we also recently added capabilities called bandwidth throttling. Keep in mind that you are trying to push data out to some public resources and the sheer amount of data, sometimes you may not have the fastest network in the world to be able to do it. So we have the capability, kind of like, uh, say, backup windows in a, in a virtualization environment, we can set how we want our traffic patterns to look, upload, download, and limit them based off of megabits per second. So I at least wanted to show that there, mostly because I could fill this out, but that would be boring, and I'm known for being a PowerShell guy. So, so why, why, the, one of the aspects of bandwidth throttling, while John's setting up the rest of the things, we have heard from customers, interestingly, they said, hey, when I have my 
my company all hands and I have all these you know various different users dialing dialing in I want to be able to control the amount of bandwidth my my other infrastructure using I was just thinking of this event and this would be a, a, a case of you know <laughs> g you know throttling the network so just giving you some real world customer context on why it is that we added that feature yeah I mean one question I just wanted to ask on this is this throttling or the amount of data that you're going to throttle in the setting is it based on just finger in the air type of estimation, or um, do you somehow monitor it? You know, how where are you getting the bottlenecks and then sort of suggest what throttling is going to, or what would be best? Um, so, the, so the way um, this throttling works is it is, uh, uh, you know, customer driven in terms of, you know, how much bandwidth they have. And many times they want to limit it based off of, you know, different uh, applications that are connected and sending traffic over the wire. So it's controlled more of a cap in terms of megabits per second that they can set for the cohesity. So, so basically it's, again, an estimation because sometimes it's not visible even to the customer what is actually causing the bottleneck. It mm -hmm. might not be your platform, it might be your platform. Mm -hmm. um, but it'll be a hit and trial type effort is what you're saying basically. So what they what they're looking for with this is basically the ability to say, hey, uh, at certain times of the day, I do not want you to be sending traffic to the cloud at uh, beyond a certain rate. Um, because everything that we do is actually parallelized. So we can take maximum um, uh, you know, utilization of what we are, what we are allowed. Uh, but sometimes it's just a question of, hey, I don't want you to go so fast. Just you know, limit your, your, your use of the network to a certain threshold. I agree, it's better than having nothing at all. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah, definitely. Thanks for the question. Okay, so uh, getting back to our demo here. As you can see, my wall of PowerShell code going on here. What, uh, uh, basically, this is to show off the fact that while the UI it, it's available, everything is based off of our, our, our REST API system in question. So anything that we do within the user interface can be accessible through uh, simple scripting languages, uh, automation frameworks, basically uh, the whole nine yards. If you can, if you can communicate with a REST API, um, you, you, can, you can route the uh, stuff through there. So this is gonna, again, connect to three different endpoints. A GCP endpoint, an Amazon S3 endpoint, and an Azure endpoint. Let me... Yay, it worked. I didn't have to sacrifice somebody. Okay, so now let's go back and take a look at my external targets. Now you can see I have three different targets registered. Um, these are going to be, so now what we have to do with the external targets is we then go into and create a policy so that we can tell it which of these external targets to use. So I go up here, um, from this point on, I'm actually gonna use the UI uh, just to be able to show off because it's kind of boring to look at uh, JSON code for the rest of the time, except for a few of the developers that might be in the room. All right, so now I gotta create a policy. Um, through our UI, I'm gonna give it a name. CFD, as you can tell, I've been prepping for this because the names are already in the drop-down menu. Uh, so just like any for our backup, uh, backup policy information, uh, we can have it how uh, for the schedule, retention components. But the big thing to add for the archival components is down here in the UI, we can add our archive. As you can see, mouse issues. Uh, so we have our, our three different archives to choose from. One thing to note also on the user interface is if for some reason we had to register an external one after the fact, we can do it from here. We were not forced to have to abandon this location and then go back in and bring it back into the list. So we can on the fly add an external target if we need be. So first things first, I'm gonna add our uh, Google Cloud Compute uh, cold line. I'm gonna tell this to run once every day. I've decided that I'm going to use Azure as my once a week. So uh, while John's adding all these targets, you will notice that we can individually control um, uh, the, the, the frequency or the schedule of each of these targets, as well as the retention. Uh, so back to the point about how we manage the retention both on-premise as well in the cloud, that's, that's, that's a key aspect of it. Uh, again, the ability to send it to multiple cloud targets at the same time uh, is something that is a, a key differentiator as well for us. Can you add multiple uh, policies per cloud? Yes, you, like can. A, you can. GFS system? Yes, you can. And just to add to that, the sort of 
the customer use case around that, what we have seen is um, if you take AWS as an example, you have S3, you have Glacier. Uh, so the policy uh, might be a little bit more aggressive or the frequency is higher when sending it to S3, exactly. but then the Glacier one might just be you know, every few months or so. Um, just because of the fact that uh, it takes longer to retrieve back from Glacier and, and really it is sort of like data that you might not touch because uh, the egress can be pretty significant from Glacier. Okay, so moving along here, now that we've got the policy created, now we have to create a, a job for our virtual machine. So now um, we've already, we've already pre-added the vCenter in question. I don't want to, everybody knows, pretty much in this room knows how to add a vCenter to uh, pretty much any tool out there. So I'm going to protect a virtual server. I'm going to call this, because if I don't, I'm going to, it's going to go red and I'm going to forget the name. So I have a, a CentOS 7 device that I'm going to use. So we have our sources listed here. Uh, again, vCenters, you can see already, um, I'm jumping the gun a little bit. I've got an Azure subscription already available here for a demo later on. But this is where all like Hyper-V instances, uh, Nutanix devices, things like that would be able to show up. And again, just like on the previous, uh, previous UI uh, description, we can register a source in, uh, basically in line right here at the same time. Okay, now to kind of show off the fact for searching through here, it's very Google-like in the search capabilities. I don't have to enter in much to find my devices in question. So you can see I, what I'm looking for is the CentOS 7-1 device, but I'm also getting pretty much anything that's got CENT in the mix as well. So I accidentally snagged my vCenter devices in the list. But um, the search capabilities are there so that we can rapidly index across um, across all of our objects and be able to find them in a rapid fashion for, for um, adding these protection jobs. Does it look at um, vCenter tags as well, if you put some mm -hmm. vCenter? Yeah, right, I'm, right now I'm basically just blasting to uh, any of the categories. Um, so if I had a tag with cent, CentOS or something in there, it would also snag it as well. Are you saying if One, you add protection jobs based on tags in vCenter? Yes. Oh. Yes. 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 And... Yeah, the one other thing I wanted to just point out, highlight here is this is this uh, icon A. What that means is if you actually select uh, at that hierarchy, let's say in this instance the host, any any virtual machine that you know comes uh, into life at, at some point in the future will automatically be picked up. Um, so, Unless you don't have to, you so go back and add exactly, exactly, yeah. Okay, so I've added my one object here for the sake of demo. Otherwise, it's going to take way too long, and I don't have enough hand puppets to, uh, to get through that. So I've got my policy. As you can see, there's my multi-cloud archive policy in question. Uh, I have to select my individual storage domain. That's more internal, cohesity, sorts of local, localized storage um, domains that we have uh, capable across the clusters. Now... Um, Right now, if I hit the protect button, as you can tell, the start time is set for immediate. It will initially kick off. You can edit some of these properties for the advanced features, but for the sake of this demo, I will actually kick this off. So you can see I've got at least now a successful launch going on of this particular job. We can follow along down here in the UI by selecting the job that we just launched. You can see my run status here. We're in the midst of running. Uh, I can click and drill into the job itself to see where we are currently at. So right now, you can see we're kicking off some subtasks. This is the initial backup job from the vCenter environment. So if I switch over to vCenter, I should be good to show. Yeah, you see we're starting to get some tasks related to disk leases and virtual machine snapshots. So we've taken our snapshot. We've done what we needed to inside of the VMware environment, and now what we should be doing is shuttling this data. Well, I jumped the gun 99%. Now for our archive task, you can see we're going to simultaneously push this out to all three of those particular clouds. So um, this is gonna take, uh, for this size of a virtual machine, I'd say somewhere in about the 30 to 40 second range, depending upon the cloud. Seeing this go to multiple clouds reminds me of something from earlier. So you can set bandwidth limits on each target. Is there any kind of global bandwidth limit? So yes. that yes. aggregate, they won't yeah. consume more than you have. Yeah, so we, yeah we, we offer the capabilities of each individual um, external target, but mm -hmm. you can also set a global over, overarching. Perfect. Uh, so those are all static thresholds, basically. Correct. Yeah, so typically what uh, customers, we have seen customers do is um, set thresholds uh, based on off of like time of day. 
Um, that's yeah. most most uh, archives uh, tend to happen during the night, uh, and then the daytime is when they do not want, uh, or they want the throttling, and, and and night is when it actually happens. All right, so we can see here that I'm successful across the board. So, uh, like I said, it took about thirty to forty seconds, and to actually show what we pushed to the cloud. What I'm going to do is I'm going to actually quickly go through each of the storage containers and we'll see that information was written. So what we're here is looking at were Microsoft Azure Storage Explorer. Obviously, if I'm a PowerShell guy, I'm going to show you the Microsoft Cloud components first. So I'm already drilled in into my blob containers. You can see this was uh, refreshed before we, before we pushed the data. Now, if I do a refresh on this location, you can now see there's three folders listed in here. Um, this is where we're pushing... Uh, some of the information in question for the snapshot information, metadata, some of the more components for the file system uh, in question. So just to show that we actually did push some data, I'm going to drill down into some folders. Each one of these folders has got the, um, some time stamping information available to it to know uh, within the system when certain things were, were performed. And now you can see I backed up. There's a, a, about four files listed in here, and they're roughly around the same modification time. Now. Let's switch over, because I showed you Azure. Now let's take a look at S3. Again, my bucket, I have not refreshed. Boom, there we go. We've got our three folders for our, our archive over there in S3. And at the same time, looking at Google Cloud Platform, once again, the three folder structure. So we're, we're and all those files should be relatively the same that were pushed out to um, all those different environments. Now, uh, based off of that, to go a little bit into the fact that we can also perform recovery options, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do just a simple lookup. I'm not going to actually perform the recovery, but at least show that we can do things like file level searches and things like that into these ar uh, archive jobs. So what I'm going to do is look for files and folders. Again, this is where the power of the indexing that we talked about comes in, because all he's doing is executing the search and we are presenting the information. And while he's doing that, he can also filter down. Um, once the search presents a set of results, we can filter it down based on other uh, you know, metadata information that we have. Um, can you also search on the basis of when something was deleted? Because sometimes you don't remember the file name, but you remember that you, know, you deleted a bunch of files yesterday. Uh, so you want to look at all of them and then pick the ones you want. I believe there is an option. Uh, so once you search for it, uh, you get all the timestamps of where the file was. So once he goes there, you will find every snapshot where this file was there. But, but, but yes, I mean, mean so, so instead of looking for a file, you search for all but, files deleted yesterday, for example, and then pick the ones you want from that. OK, OK. You can do that? Yep. Yeah. Right, okay. So typically what happens in that case is the deletion happens on premise which means the copy is existing in the cloud so what you can what we you can do is you can just go and look at hey I want this data set from the cloud and recover it accordingly and, and just to show for the most part when it comes to the recover points, you can see here I have my four targets listed. I've got my local target, and you can mouse over and take a look and see all the different locations and based off of it, select from which one you want to pull that file from. Okay. Cool. So there's one other aspect of uh, that life cycle we talked about, which was the, the VM migration, right? So we're going to... We're going to talk about you know what that is and the the, the feature um, just the way we codenamed it it's called cloud spin. Um, so the idea is again the data lands on premise. Um, we do the backup everything that you already saw that uh, that uh, John demoed. Um, now we take this data and using cloud spin we actually spin those uh, virtual machines in the cloud. This will actually set the basis for what you will see later on, which is more about how do you extend this to taking applications and enabling application mobility. But the idea here is this is where we take care of those format conversions, depending on uh, your source and what your destination is, right? Uh, and obviously, like the benefits with this is we make it really simple and easy um, for, for the end um, cu customer, because 
these are not trivial operations, right? I mean, if you have to work with various different cloud vendors, their APIs, the formats, everything is now seamlessly controlled just with, with policies, right? Uh, and then obviously it enables migration of data from on-premise to the cloud. So with that set up, let me hand it over back to John so he can actually show this in action. Okay. So we're gonna go back to my, my RDP session here. Um, so we're gonna take that same virtual machine that we just performed the cloud archive uh, operations to, and we're gonna set up to my Azure subscription. And what we should see by the end of this is a full VHD uh, offloaded into my blob container that I have out there. So just like, uh, just like how we registered an external target, we can register extra sources. Uh, you can see here we have multiple different source types. I do have my Azure subscription down here. And just to show that we are not trying to uh, pull any fancy fooling games here, um, I have a resource group uh, labeled there. And as you just flip over, so there we go. It's my same resource group. Uh, we, are at, we are going to the live resource group out in US West 2 that I have set up. Okay. Um, and just like anything else, adding, especially from a cloud entity, um, I would show it, but I don't want to blast my subscription IDs and my uh, pass keys and everything else uh, over the internet and accumulate a $4,000 bill during the time of this particular uh, recording. So that being said, we have that available out there. Um, just like anything else, we're going to do this from a policy perspective. We're going to slap it on um, to a virtual machine uh, policy. I do have one available. I'll show you, some, show you what some look like as they go long term if we get more and more of these copies available. But we're going to create an initial policy up here. Um, for those cloud spin to Azure. Very similarly to the same sort of policy that we created beforehand. The only difference is I'm going to select down here to add cloud spin. Um, to some degree, we're going to get into some of the cloud specifics. I know there were some questions about adding like networking and things like that. Um, at least up front, I do have to specify, especially depending upon the cloud entity. So in this case, I have to specify a resource group that I have access to, a storage account, and then listed beneath it an actual storage container. So all that information is being pulled. Um, when we get into like actually firing the virtual machines off, then we can get into adding networking constructs. But those things already should already exist out in your subscriptions to begin with. Um, so question real quick. Yeah. Um, if there's a kitchen policy here, mm -hmm. if I wanted to refresh that setup every 90 days, how would I do that? Yeah, so what happens, this retention here is basically, uh, re it's the amount of time your VHD or ARMY image is actually retained in the cloud. Because ultimately, that image is what is used to spin off either a, an Azure compute or, a, or an ARMY image, right? So what, the way it gets refreshed is, uh, you saw the policy again, right? So I think in John's case, he had it every uh, week or so. Mm -hmm. So what's going to happen is the the the, um, the current week's copy is going to stay for 90 and then it gets refreshed over and over. And that's the idea in also leveraging that for test and dev purpose because then your developers can work with a more recent copy of the data. You know what, I mean, one cool feature would be, yep. I'm thinking that... We're always looking for feedback, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, you know, once you have this kind of environment, so currently maybe you can't do it, but I'm sure that this will be a good feature that if you have a bunch of machines, you. You create a blueprint once, for example, mm -hmm. for it to be recreated in test and dev. But because API functionality is available on the public cloud, right, mm -hmm. you can create those constructs on the fly when they are required. So just like a CloudFormation template or an ARM template, you basically have that kind of environment defined. And when someone wants to test, a bunch of machines get restored. So those networking constructs yeah. are built into the cloud and they are restored into that. So it's an instant test and dev environment complete with networking. And that would be a really good feature. And I, th I don't think it'll be too difficult for you guys to do it. Yeah, actually, I, I can say you, 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 you are already uh, you know, halfway there in terms of getting into the product engineering side because that's exactly what we are looking to build. Um, so some of the engineering folks are already working on making that sort of a, a template. Yeah. Um, um, so, so thanks for that feedback and uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, since we're Asking for features? <laughs> uh, uh -oh. We were not asking throat. for features, but I guess we got there. But. Um, okay, so uh, much like I'm thinking about the power of, of, a, of a cloud formation template, ARM templates, et cetera, uh, once that VM is spun up, uh, 
do we have the ability to run our own scripts after that? Uh, because I, I'm thinking of cases where, uh, all right, I've cloned my data, but maybe in my test environment, I'm not allowed to have live data, so I need to run some kind of data sanit mm -hmm. sanitization script or something else. Mm -hmm. um, is that something that Absolutely. Uh, is on the it's, roadmap? It's, it's, it, is, it is very much, it's actually mm -hmm. coming up in one of our uh, next uh, releases in terms of the ability to do what we call as pre and post scripts. And yeah. just for everybody's benefit and for the benefit of the viewers on uh, watching it live, the, uh, the, the, the customer use case around it is, um, you know, they want to change some things. Once, right. once things are backed up, either to obfuscate something, mask something, uh, or, or just customize things, sometimes around some of the networking elements. So those are the use cases that we have heard in terms of the, the pre and post scripts. So yeah, it's coming. Okay, so I, I kind of, just for the sake of time, jumped ahead a little here. Um, very similar to setting up the, the policy. So we set up the policy for Cloud Spin out to my, uh, my Azure subscription. We're setting up the job, but in this particular case, we're selecting that policy that we put Cloud Spin into, and I'm gonna hit the Protect button on this, and it should, we should start to see, yeah, we have a job. There it is. Uh, so we're going to perform our operation, and then, as as mentioned, we're gonna we're gonna convert this over to a VHD file. While that's going, because this is gonna take a couple of minutes, obviously it's got a package and, and ship ship over. What I also have is a prior job that I, I've let run, so I'm probably accumulating a pretty good amount of uh, storage cost um, on my Azure account uh, here, where I've shown that I've, I've done the job multiple times. So I, I sh what I should be here seeing is I should have maybe, I believe, five copies of this VHD file. And in this particular case, I was doing it every hour. So I was being very aggressive in, in showing that. So we're gonna walk through the storage explorer again. And as we can see there, I've got multiple VHD copies available. And they're generally, so they're my 20 gig virtual machine, because again, I'm doing this on a small, smaller form factor. Obviously, time and, time and energy is going to be a lot more the bigger these things are uh, moving forward. But I do have, there's about an hour separation, and I do have um, uh, timestamps showing off that we have made multiple copies. Now, the one thing to keep in mind when setting up a job with this is that uh, if, if you get aggressive, you're, you're going to accumulate VHD files like no other. And that's uh, uh, the, the one thing you end up finding out is you're going to spend a ton on storage. Are those VHD files in the cloud the duplicated or is there some saving in terms of space? I, I, I believe they are because in this particular case, think of it a little bit like thin provisioning. Um, it, it's telling me that it can take up to 20 gig, but in actuality, it's probably only using a, a sliver of that available. So I'm probably uh, drastically overestimating my Azure bill at this point. It's probably more like 26 cents to, to keep that copy. So a couple of us have been tweeting about your uh, dashboard oh, UI. It's pretty good you. stuff. Cool. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I, I closed it. I did a yeah. disconnect. And I think I think it's really good because also that um, uh, it's human nature that people like the kind of things or work with things which are easier to use. And uh, if a great UI actually goes a long way in allowing that to happen. So yeah. definitely. If, if not already, we'll make sure we pass that off to our... UX and UI designers, so thank you very much. That's pretty good. The one thing I would say, however, is that you know there are certain, so in, in the screens, what I think some applic uh, UIs lack is some guidance. So you know, if you hover above a certain setting, then you know, a pop-up screen that comes up that you know, this is what you're supposed to put in there. I think that's missing still, or at least I didn't notice that to be there. No, I think John was too perfect. Uh, which is why, you know, everything, you can see some, some of the elements of that. Uh, but yes, uh, we do have uh, some descriptions and help text uh, wherever relevant.